When was the last time you heard of a crime so disturbing it stuck with you for a long, long time? Well, buckle up, ladies and gents, because the case on the docket today, the case of Black Dahlia, is one of those stories. The Cecil Hotel continues its chilling curse. It's like something out of a movie, but all too real. Before you're traumatized with all the gruesome details in this case, let's dig into who the Black Dahlia was before the infamy. Way before the world hears about the Black Dahlia, Elizabeth Short is born in Boston, Massachusetts in 1924. She's the third daughter of five girls. The Short family move out of Massachusetts in 1927 and settle in Portland, Maine. Things are good for a while, until 1929. The stock market crashes, and Elizabeth's father loses all their money, much like many Americans of the time. But one day, his car is found abandoned on the Charlestown Bridge. Everyone assumes he's jumped to his death, a suicide. More on this in just a minute. Elizabeth has some health issues growing up. She has lung surgery when she's 15, and doctors recommend that she spends more time in a milder climate. She splits her time between Massachusetts with her mother and Florida with family friends. She drops out of high school her sophomore year. In 1942, Elizabeth's mother receives a surprising letter. It's from Elizabeth's father. He hadn't committed suicide, but instead dropped everything to start a new life in California. Elizabeth hasn't seen him since she was six and moves to live with him for a little while. Sadly, they don't get along. And in January 1943, after months of arguing, Elizabeth moves out again. This time, she moves in with a few friends and an Air Force sergeant. But the living situation isn't ideal either because the sergeant abuses her. So Elizabeth leaves and moves to Santa Barbara, California. On September 23rd, 1943, she gets her first mark on her criminal record. Okay, so while she's only arrested for underage drinking, the court demands she moves back to Massachusetts to live with her mother. But it's a firm no from Elizabeth. She doesn't want to go back to Massachusetts, so goes back to Florida instead throwing in the occasional visit with her mother. In Florida, Elizabeth meets her Prince Charming, or so she thought. He is Major Matthew Michael Gordon Jr., and he's a decorated officer in the Air Force. Gordon survives a plane crash while serving in India. During his recovery, he proposes to Elizabeth in a letter. But there's no happy ending for this couple. On August 10, 1945, just a week before Japan's surrender, Gordon is in a second plane crash, and this time, he doesn't make it out alive. A year passes by with no trouble before Elizabeth decides to visit an old friend in Los Angeles. It's July 1946, and her friend is Lieutenant Joseph Gordon Flicking, who she met back in Florida. She decides to stick around in LA for a while and picks up work as a waitress. In January 1947, Elizabeth Short is seen having a drink at the Cecil Hotel. Who she met there is not known. Perhaps a friend, a business associate, or a boyfriend. No matter who they are, what we know is that the Cecil's dark, unlucky energy follows Elizabeth Short as she leaves. Around this time, Elizabeth is dating Robert Manley. He's 25, a salesman, and married. but. They take a quick trip to San Diego together. Nothing suspicious going on here, right? When they get back from San Diego on January 9th, Manley drops Elizabeth off at the Biltmore Hotel in downtown Los Angeles. Apparently, she has plans to meet her sister. She checks in her luggage at the Biltmore and staff see her use the lobby phone. She's spotted in the area a little later by customers at the Crown Grill Cocktail Lounge. It would be the last time she's seen alive. It's now January 15th, 1947, in Leimert Park, Los Angeles. Betty Bersinger is enjoying a pleasant morning walk with her three-year-old daughter, Anne. 
Along the way, they pass an empty, grassy lot, and Betty notices something odd sticking out. At first, she thinks she's looking at an abandoned mannequin that's broken, left in a strange place. But then she realizes it's actually a woman. She thinks the woman must have gotten drunk and passed out. But then, the horror washes over her. In an interview, Betty Bersinger says, I was terribly shocked and scared to death. I grabbed Anne and we walked as fast as we could to the first house that had a telephone. Upon realizing she's found a dead body, Betty calls the police. It doesn't take long before the body draws the attention of reporters who show up to document the grisly details. The scene is beyond surreal. As an unidentified woman, the body is named Jane Doe. It has been very precisely mutilated, split in half, and left without a drop of blood on or around the body. Photographs on the scene really do look like movie props. It's terrifying. Aggie Underwood, a reporter for the Herald Express, is one of the first on the scene. In a report, she details the horror explicitly. She writes, The body had been cut in half through the abdomen, under the ribs. The two sections were 10 or 12 inches apart. The arms, bent at right angles at the elbows, were raised above the shoulders. The legs were spread apart. There were bruises and cuts on the forehead and the face, which had been beaten severely. The hair was matted with blood. Front teeth were missing. Both cheeks were slashed from the corners of the lips, almost to the ears. The liver hung out of the torso, and the entire lower section of the body had been hacked, gouged, and unprintably desecrated. It showed sadism at its most frenzied. The crowd of onlookers and reporters grows too big, and police are furious that the crime scene is being contaminated. The two detectives assigned to the case are Harry Hansen and Finnis Brown. They clear the area, and the race to solve the mystery begins. Police transfer the body to the LA County morgue, while others search the area. Fingerprints are sent to the FBI, and after uh, some few delays, a match is found. Jane Doe is Elizabeth Short. Her fingerprints appear twice in FBI records, once for her arrest for underage drinking and another when she applied to work for the army. So they know who the victim is, but who are the suspects? They had none. Investigators decide Jane Doe was murdered somewhere else before her body was moved and left in the grassy lot where it would be discovered. She had been dead approximately 10 hours before she was found. On January 17, 1947, Elizabeth Short gains national fame when her photograph appears on the front page of the Herald Express. This is the first time the name Black Dahlia is officially published. There are debates about where this name came from. Some say the media made it up to sell more copies. Others say that members of the public thought of it first and the newspapers picked it up. The name refers to a murder mystery film noir called Blue Dahlia, starring Veronica Lake. The blue is changed to black to match Elizabeth Short's dark hair and her love of black clothes. The investigation quickly becomes one of LA's most high profile and the LAPD need to borrow extra officers from other police departments to assist. They investigate every person known to Short, including 20 men reported to be former boyfriends. On January 23rd, 1947, just over a week after the discovery of the body, a call is made to the newspaper The Examiner. The editor, J.H. Richardson, takes the call. It's a man claiming to be Elizabeth's killer, and he's unhappy about how the story is being told in the papers. He offers to send Elizabeth's belongings to The Examiner as proof. The next day, on the 24th, a package arrives containing items related to Short, like photographs, business cards, her birth certificate, and an address book belonging to a Mark Hansen. It's accompanied by a letter made from magazine cuttings. Mark Hansen is identified as someone Elizabeth spent some time living with, and he becomes the first suspect in the case. 
On the same day, Elizabeth's handbag and shoes are found in a trash can a few miles from the crime scene. Robert Manley is called in to confirm these were the belongings he last saw with Elizabeth. The distance of the items from the crime scene indicates that the killer may be located close to both areas as they're within walking distance of each other. The search for the killer continues, but it isn't easy pinning down to one suspect. As time passes, more and more people are added to the list. The mutilations suggest that the killer is someone with medical training, so on February 25th, 1947, the LAPD requests that the FBI look into medical students currently studying in Southern California. On March 6th, the FBI sent a complete list of medical students at USC. At this point, the LAPD start investigating over 150 potential suspects. By June 1947, they take 75 suspects off the list, but they're no closer to an answer. One suspect is a bellhop named Leslie Dillon. In October 1948, Dillon makes contact with the LAPD psychiatrist Dr. J. Paul DeRiver to ask questions about the Black Dahlia case. He says he's learning about psychopaths and sadism in order to write a book on the subject. Dillon quickly becomes a person of interest for the LAPD. He writes back and forth with DeRiver and tells him about a man called Jeff Connors who Dylan says is the Black Dahlia's murderer. But the river begins to think that Connors doesn't really exist. Dylan might have created this alter ego to block out his own horrific acts. The Rivers and an undercover detective manage to meet with Dylan and interrogate him. Dylan reveals his extensive knowledge about dealing with dead bodies, thanks to his time spent as a mortician's assistant. They travel to San Francisco together in search of Dylan's friend Connors, but when they don't find him, police detain Dylan at a hotel near LA. They deny Dylan his constitutional rights, holding him without charge, and interrogate him again. Eventually, Dylan provides the police with very specific details about the murder, including information the police hadn't previously been able to explain. It seems like Dylan could be the Black Dahlia murderer after all. He's officially taken into custody on January 10th, 1949. The next night, San Francisco PD contact the LA police to say they found Jeff Connors. His name is really Artie Lane, and he worked at Columbia Studios around the time Elizabeth Short was hanging out there. But there isn't strong enough evidence against either Dylan or Lane, and eventually police take them off the list of suspects. Police decide that Dylan was in San Francisco when Short was murdered, but there is no way to confirm where he was during the days she was missing. Dylan attempts to file a lawsuit for $100,000 against the LAPD for how he was treated. He quickly drops the case though when it's revealed he's wanted for stealing from the hotel he worked at. So the Black Dahlia investigation continues through to the end of 1948. Over 200 suspects have been investigated, with strong leads dissolving into dead ends. It's clear the process has been a complete failure, and in early 1949, the grand jury is called in to discuss the case. They cover the suspects and evidence, as well as the police corruption that tainted the investigation. The grand jury report details the potential for a police cover-up in the investigation, but ultimately, no real answers are ever found. The case is a complete mess. Elizabeth Short does not receive the justice she deserves. A young woman with a difficult past is brutally murdered and instead of empathy, her name is dragged through the mud. Newspapers spread rumors about her being a prostitute despite there being no evidence. Others suggest that her terrible end was to be expected because of how she lived her life. Over the years, others claim to be her killer or claim to know her killer, but in the end, it doesn't matter. The murder of Elizabeth Short will likely never be solved, despite its brutality and despite its fame. This is the unforgettable case of the Black Dahlia. Thank you so, so much for watching. 
If you like this video and want to be first in line for new videos, subscribe to the channel right now so you don't miss out. And please, hit the thumbs up button if you like this video and don't forget to share, share, share with your friends. It goes a long way to helping the channel and it doesn't cost you anything. I'll see you real soon in the next one, part 3 of the Cecil Hotel. Thanks for watching.